Uh, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really, really nice to welcome you for the, this Michaelmas term lecture of, uh, hosted by the Oriel Environmental Group. Um, and we're extremely pleased um, to welcome Hugo here. I'll just do a very short bio, because it's a long one. Uh, but Hugo is, a, is an alumnus of Oriel, graduate, I won't say where he graduated, <laughs> but from engineering sciences. Um, and after leaving, had a career in motorsports, as in both driving and engineering capacities. Um, but left towards the end of the 90s, uh, concerned about the environmental consequences of uh, racing. And set up uh, initially a company called Oscar Automotive in 2001, which then became River Simple in 2007. And I hope most, if not all of you, have seen River Simple's uh, output part in First Quad currently. Um, there's a lot of really great uh, attributions to River Simple, a few of which I've selected. So it was elected as an emerging innovator by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And for those unfamiliar, Ellen MacArthur is a pioneer of thinking around the circular economy. And you may be wondering what the circular economy has to do with cars, and Hugo will, will explain um, in his talk. He was also, uh, in 2018, River Simple was named uh, on the top 100 disruptive innovators list. And again, for those unfamiliar with the disruptive innovation concept, I think Hugo will be discussing this and we'll be talking about this later. Um, my favourite of all Hugo's accolades is in 2019, he won the Unreasonable Person Award. <laughs> Uh, at the London Business School uh, for showing enormous tenacity and stubbornness in pursuing an idea despite the difficulties encountered along the way, which sounds like a good recipe for success in contemporary life. And then in 2022, Hugo was awarded an MBE uh, for his outstanding contributions to innovation and technology. So really, really um, uh, warm welcome back, back to Oriel. Uh, so Hugo's gonna talk for about half an hour. Uh, I'll leave him obviously to, exp to explain what, about River Simple and, uh, and the cars they make. And then I'll sort of start the conversation afterwards with a few questions and then we'll obviously welcome questions, comments and feedback from you um, in the audience. And we'll wrap up in about an hour and then have some drinks afterwards, so lots of time to talk with Hugo further then. So without further ado, welcome Hugo. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that warm welcome and it's a delight to be back here after so many years. And, uh, uh, speaking to you today, and driving a car into the quad is something I never attempted when I was at university. <laughs> attempted that I might have been. Um, uh, I uh, want to first of all, to the avoidance of doubt, say that River Simple, we're building hydrogen cars, but we're not a hydrogen car company, we're a sustainable car company. And uh, I, we are building hydrogen cars because I don't believe that anything can be as sustainable as a hydrogen car for the sort of range to which we've become accustomed. Um, but uh, we should not be having this war of words between batteries and hydrogen. I just want to get this out of the way right at the beginning. Uh, because we don't argue about solar PV or wind turbines, which one's going to win the renewable energy race. They're just different, and we need them both. And the same is true of batteries and hydrogen. But to our mind, uh, nobody's really doing hydrogen very well yet. So it's the real opportunity, and it's the, it's a, it's the gaping need at, at the moment. Um, I'm going to not talk very much about the technology at all. We can talk about it in Q&A if, if, if or, or later. Um, I'm more talking about the, the, the wider issues of delivering sustainable solutions. Um, and I'll start off just by showing this totally generic slide. This, this affects every business, every country on the planet, really. We're going through a, into a converging funnel, which is essentially driven by resource depletion, climate change, environmental pressures, and the regulatory response, it, uh, which is a damage limitation exercise. And it's because, it's not very surprising, because the business models of, of, it, of today evolved over the last couple of hundred years, when we were but a pinprick on the side of the planet, and so natural capital really didn't count for anything. The limitations were labour and technology. But absolutely, they are not now. The, the limitations are, are environmental. And traditional business, business models, which are, by and large, the business models of most of industry today, are bumping along the walls of the funnel. It's painful and expensive to stay within those constraints. But it isn't surprising, because the profit motive lies way outside the funnel. 
I mean, if you sell cars, you make more money by selling more cars. I mean, it's pretty basic, but the consequence of that is that you're rewarded for maximising resource consumption. And I don't see how we can ever have a sustainable industrial society based on rewarding industry for the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. But it's also not very smart business, because we can argue about the, the timescales when you hit peak resources of oil or copper or whatever it may be, but you can't argue about the direction of the trend. And so if you persist in this with these business models, you're betting all your future profits against these known and undisputable trends. So it just makes sense to, to try and build a business that profits from staying in the middle of the stream. So what we're trying to do with our business model is, is to turn all those costs of sustainability into sources of competitive advantage, making sustainability profitable. And I think this, that these business model, and, I, and we'll come on to it, the governance issues, are every bit as important as the technologies. Um, and, and if we don't internalise these problems and act and do something about it, I really do think that we've got a, a problem somewhat akin to King Canute. Um, there are many axes of sustainability, and the thing that really focuses our minds at the moment is net zero, and climate change is clearly the most urgent and pressing problem, and, and, I, and I absolutely agree with that. But there are lots of other issues, and if we focus on net zero to the exclusion of all else, I think it would be a completely pyrrhic victory. We've got to address all these problems at once, and that sounds a bit ambitious, and we cannot, I don't believe, tackle all these problems individually. We've got to tackle them all at once. It sounds ambitious, but I believe it's actually easier than tackling them one at a time. And in fact, I think it's the only way we can address them. I don't think there's another way. So we need to, we need a whole system design approach. Um, and by that I mean optimising the whole system rather than focusing on the components of the system and optimising them. In fact, I go so far as to say that in any complex system, if you focus on optimising the components, you pessimise the whole. And, uh, and I think we're in grave danger of that. So there are lots of other axes, as I said. Uh, I'll only just talk now about one that's acutely relevant to cars, and that's critical materials. Um, a renewable world is much more dependent on critical materials than a fossil-based world. In the fossil-based world, we can pretty much muddle through on steel and aluminium. But a renewable world, we need everything north of copper northwards in rarity by orders of magnitude more uh, than we are uh, uh, extracting at the moment. And um, I mean, it's not just cars either. Um, I mean, look, this is from the IEA, it's a 13 fold increase by 2030 and we can't open mines that quickly and, and if we do we won't have much of a planet left. Um, but, and that's what's needed according to the IEA for hydrogen fuel cell technology as a comparison. But there are all sorts of other things, it's solar PV, it's wind turbines, let alone mobile phones and so on. So we have got a, a huge problem, we've got to find ways of more wisely allocating uh, these critical materials that we have at the moment. Um, very quickly, lithium I picked out as one. Uh, the US Geological Survey reckoned that between 55 and 60 percent of the extractable reserves for lithium are in that triangle. Um, and if you look at a Google map of Chile, I've drawn a red circle around those two blotches. At nation scale, they're man-made. If you blow them up, you can see that these are evaporation ponds and um, uh, for lithium carbonate. Tesla say they have 12 kilos of lithium in, in, a, in a battery in one of their cars. And to extract enough lithium carbonate from these to deliver 12 kilos of lithium requires 26 tonnes of water. And this is the driest place on the planet. And the water table is 100 metres below deck, and it's going downstairs rapidly, and it's becoming more saline. So all the indigenous peoples around the edge are already in a water-stressed lifestyle anyway, 
and are finding it more and more difficult. And Chile wants to reduce its mining and extraction for the rest of the world because it's fed up with being abused. So uh, we've got a real problem if we think we're going to do it all with battery cars. We've got a few percent of cars on the planet running on batteries. I'm sure we'll learn to recycle it. Uh, I see no reason why it can't be done. I hope we will. But even if we recycle all those batteries and all the cars on the planet, 95% plus of the cars that we're running on petrol sure, are going to have to be replaced with virgin materials. And so we have got a, 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 an enormous issue with that. And this is why uh, we're pursuing uh, hydrogen cars uh, for, um, to complement battery cars. This is our purpose statement. Um, it's not a fl fluffy PR line, it's actually embedded in our Articles of Association as a fiduciary responsibility of the board. And it's to pursue systematically the elimination of the environmental impact of personal transport. And there are two key words in that. The first is elimination. Um, reduction of environmental impact is simply not an adequate goal. In the being less unsustainable is still not sustainable. That's got to be the end goal. But it's an ambitious one. We're not going to get there overnight. And so the other key word is systematically. We've got to make sure that every investment we make, every step we take, is taking us towards that end goal. And so uh, one of the things we talk about a lot is that all our um, business model strategies are all developed through a backcasting methodology rather than a forecasting one. And um, if you think of a tree and we want to get to the crown of the tree, it's all too easy, if you forecast, to go for the low-hanging fruit on the lower branches. And it's less damaging. But these are technologies that have no hope of ever being truly sustainable. And you get to a dead end at the end of the branch. And dead ends are really bad because you can't get to the top of the tree. And you've got to write off all the investment you've made in getting to the wrong place and start again. But if you backcast a strategy from the top of the tree, you can't fail to end up uh, at the bottom where you are now. And it means that we're focused on developing strategies that, uh, de developing technologies that have a roadmap toward to that end game of a tr completely sustainable system. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, also, I should say that River Simple is a for-profit company. It is not an NGO. It's a private sector business, and I believe that you can build a business that is going to be more profitable this way anyway. It's better business. Um, if we're going to have any real impact, we want people to copy us. And uh, we're developing different standards, so we don't want to get into a standards war. We want support. It's in our interests to uh, uh, effectively to open source. Our IP strategy is largely based around, around that. And um, uh, if we, get, we need to do that if we're going to have any real impact. But to do that, you've got to demonstrate that you can make more money from doing the right thing than business as usual makes from doing the wrong thing. Um, and so we're not just about designing the car, but about designing the system that delivers it. Uh, and this is still all design, to my mind. And, and designing the system to deliver it, I think, is the biggest design problem we face today. Um, and we talk about three levels of design. There's the product, there's design of the, 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 the strategy, the business model, and all the other strategies. And there's design, and I was told this actually by, um, initially, 20 years ago, by somebody who was the um, director of the design council, who said increasing design worlds talk about these three levels, levels of design, one, two, and three. And D3, he talked about design as design level of ideology, purpose, sustainability, and, and that impacts us in terms of designing our corporate governance. And all of these things are connected, but, they, but the connection tends, the inference tends to be top down. The governance shapes, uh, defines the, 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 the purpose, defines what you're trying to do. And that feeds down into the business model as to how you're going to do what you're trying to do. The business model creates all the financial drivers that, do, that drive all your design choices at the level of designing the product. So you can't just design a car and then start worrying about the business strategies and the governance later, as we were told to do many times, many years ago. 
the idea of thinking about corporate governance and designing a new corporate governance structure when you were still a startup pre-revenue uh, was lost on people. But you can never retrofit that to a company that's in business because people have to give up rights and acquire new responsibilities. They don't like doing that. The only time you can ever do that is right at the beginning. And it's akin to Joanna Macy, a great uh, sustainability educator, who talks about three levels of change. There's specific actions to deal with problems. There's structural changes, and then there's a shift in consciousness. And I think this is reflected in, in the three levels of design we talk about. But I'm going to speak about them in reverse. Um, as I say, the technologies, it's quite radical, but it's, it's to my mind, the easy bit. Uh, the real problems are to do with people and politics and inertia, and so uh, um, that I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the business model and the, the governance to cover that. Um, all of this is a step change. We've been through, lived through a period of lots of incremental optimization of systems, but, I, but the, the world around us, it, there's been a step change in auto, okay, from mechanical to electric platforms. That's a huge step change. But the world around us, we're going through a step change, as I said, these new conditions, the new constraints that really are shaping, shaping our activity, on, they weren't on the radar. And when you go through step changes, incremental optimization is really not good enough. And I'd like to make a quick observation about whenever, whenever a new idea comes up, all the conversation, like a lightning rod, goes to the reasons why it can't be done. And generally speaking, I think those reasons are true. You're absolutely right. But the assumption is being made that the new idea is going to replace the old idea directly. And the old idea is embedded in a context. It's, it's embedded in a pattern of relationships that co-evolved with that old idea. And it's that pattern of relationships that creates all the barriers as to why the new idea won't work. But if you're prepared to reinvent the entire pattern of relationships, the context, then suddenly the new, all the barriers fall away and the new idea can suddenly look an awful lot more appealing. Um, <clears throat> now, again, this is a matter of whole system design, as I was uh, talking about um, uh, earlier. Uh, and um, it's optimising at the system level. And when I say optimising at the system level, I can give a, a, a concrete example in that when we're choosing components in a car, we don't compare alternative components with each other. We've got, we spent more than 15 years developing our simulation model of the car. And we put each alternative component into the simulation model and decide which gives us the best car. Now we routinely will choose a component that's heavier or more expensive or less efficient because it gives us a car that's lighter, cheaper or more efficient. And it's very counterintuitive in a reductionist world, but, it's, but it, it, it leads to wholly different outcomes if you take, really focus on the, on the system level. Um, and I'd even go to talk about, sub, if you focus on the subsystem level, it's really, subsystem optimization is really limiting the downside you're limited upside-wise by a ceiling, and the ceiling is defined by the system. So this is the devil in the detail type of approach. It is all about downside. If you, on the other hand, you look at the system level, that's where the upside potential is. So we like to say that God is in the system. Devil's in the detail, but God's in the system. Um, we're also, so briefly about the cars. Um, We've had the, the, the unique opportunity, unlike an existing car manufacturer, designed from a clean sheet of paper. Um, we're not trying to squeeze hydrogen into a platform and a technology and a manufacturing model and a business model and a distribution model and a customer proposition, all of which has been shaped over 100 years by petrol engines. We've got a completely sheet, clean sheet of paper. I mean, there are very few advantages to being a startup, but the one really big one is this clean sheet of paper. And so this, the car in the, in the quad is, is called the Raza, as in Tabula Raza, because we've had the advantage of a clean sheet. But it applies to the business model as much as it does to the technology. Um, and um, we've got four electric motors in the four wheels. We've got a fuel cell in the back that provides electricity to the electric motors. We've got no transmission system. 
Um, the only moving parts in the car are the wheel bearings. It's the only high-speed metal-to-metal uh, contact. So there's no lubricants, no oil changes, no mechanical wear. All the structural materials are inert, so there's no corrosion. Um, the electric motors are also the primary brakes. 99% of our braking is done electrically. And that energy is stored in the bank of supercapacitors at the front. We have no batteries in the car. Um, the fuel cell at the back is capable of powering the car at, a, at its maximum constant design cruise speed, which is 60 miles an hour. It's only 10 kilowatts. It's just enough to power three domestic kettles. But you can keep this car running at 60 miles an hour for 300 miles. Uh, but you can also accelerate to 60 miles an hour in only nine and a half seconds. You can't do that on the 10 kilowatts of the fuel cell. About 60 kilowatts or 70 kilowatts comes from the supercapacitors at the front. But you can only rely on those supercapacitors. You can only rely on those supercapacitors if you have very, very efficient regen braking. And this is why we have four electric motors and the four wheels because we don't ever want to use friction. We want to capture as much of the energy, kinetic energy of the car every time we slow down. <coughs> and the Prius, the most you'll recover is about 10% of the kinetic energy. We can recover 55% of the kinetic energy electrically into the supercapacitors in the car. And the big advantage to that is not that we've saved a bit of energy that we can use again, but that we can have a fuel cell of only 10 kilowatts. If we couldn't rely on the supercapacitors, we'd need a much bigger fuel cell, and fuel cells are very expensive, and double the power in a fuel cell costs double, twice as much. So um, that's the, the basic platform. We've been through five generations of car um, uh, over 20 years. Um, the Life Car and the Herban, we developed actually with the engineering department here, at the Electric Motors. And, and that company, we're joint patentees with a company called Yasa Motors that spun out uh, uh, of the university and is now being bought by Mercedes-Benz. Um, and the fourth car, that light blue one, was the first car that we built for use on the public road. The fifth car is a very similar shape, but is actually wholly different under the skin. Um, and these are some <coughs> stats I've really told you about them already. Nine and a half seconds, 60. It did, this is the prototype it did originally at 250, the equivalent of 250 miles per gallon. Um, even using that, because it's so efficient, even using natural gas as the source of hydrogen, where you do emit CO2, we're still only 40 grams per kilometre, um, which is 60% less on a well-to-wheel basis than the best, lowest emitting petrol cars today. Um, and obviously if it's, um, if it's green hydrogen, you're down to three or four grams per kilometre. Uh, that's uh, a Toyota Mirai. Um, the Mirai at the same time we bought that car a few years ago. Um, and that has the same acceleration of 0 to 60 in nine and a half seconds. It's not equivalent, I mean, it's a five-door, five-seater car. Uh, it's fully certified. Ours is a two-seater car that isn't fully certified. But, um, uh, but it has a fuel cell over 12 times as powerful, and it uses three times as much hydrogen per mile. And the difference shouldn't be so big. And I certainly heard a figure a few years ago that they'd spent over nine billion, and I can assure you we haven't. So, and these are the cars, the beta cars that we're running at the moment. We do a, uh, an EV rally down to um, Paris in the summer and we've got um, them in beta tests with paying customers in Montmartre now. And I'd like to put in also a plea about um, system level innovation, just how powerful it is. Um, we took three years to get to find the money from the UK government, a million pounds, to develop the Life Car, the first of those two cars with Morgan because we weren't developing a new widget, a new technology, a new component, a new material that could be patented. And you think, well, maybe a 300% improvement in energy efficiency is of interest. But because they couldn't nail it to a, some, to a patent, we got turned down again and again. And, um, and system level innovation, I feel, culturally, we are fairly blind to its potential. Um, coming from motorsport, I like to use a motorsport analogy. We're pretty dominant in the, in the UK now in motorsport, but in the 50s we were nowhere, and Ferrari dominated. And they had hundreds of people building these beautiful jewel-like V12 engines. That was the heart of the beast, as far as they were concerned. And then five, sorry, five men in a shed in Kingston went and bought a four-cylinder engine off the shelf that anybody else could buy, and it was much less powerful, but they built a different sort of car. 
And it's basically a different pattern of relationships between all the components. And there's Jack Brabham at uh, Monaco, the first Grand Prix of 1959, which he won. And he won five out of nine Grand Prix that year. They completely demolished Ferrari. And then Lotus came along and did it even better. But the point of the story is that Lotus and Cooper built the foundations of the British motorsport industry, and neither of them ever built an engine. Their competitive advantage entirely came from system-level innovation. Now, let's, to move on to the, the, the business model, um, it's much harder to change business models than technology for incumbent manufacturers. I completely appreciate this. Um, but I do believe it's much easier to design, just like with cars, it's easier to design a car for hydrogen from a clean sheet of paper than to adapt a petrol car. It's easier to design a business model for the 21st century than to try and tweak a business model that was designed to do something fundamentally different. And um, if you sell cars, your interests are obsolescent, built in obsolescence is a term invented by the industry. And high running costs, on average, the markup on spare parts is 1500%. To the interests of customers. And as I've already said, it's opposite to the interests of the environment and policy makers. But we'd even argue that there's a negative incentive to improve efficiency. It does take more to, make, to cost more to make a more efficient car, but customers will never pay a premium. They always discount future cost savings almost to zero. And if it costs you more, but the customer won't pay you anymore, it reduces your profit margin. Therein lies the negative incentive. And these two cars were made by the same company, 70 years apart. The car on the left did 38 miles to the gun. The car on the right did 38.6 miles to the gun. And you might think that we could expect a bit more progress in 70 years than that, especially when you consider the old crisis was in 1973, less than halfway through that period. But the reality is that there isn't an incentive to do so. And, and I believe the change in business model is as important as the change in technology. And if we could make efficiency profitable, we'd have a rash of cars out there tomorrow doing 100 miles to gallon. So we plan never to sell a car. We're never going to sell a service. And, um, and it's, it's for the customer, it's very like a lease or a PCP. 90% of new cars are sold on finance today. Title stays with the finance company, but the customer feels it's their car. The difference, though, is very extreme. I mean, it, we're doing it for the opposite reason the industry is doing it. They do it to try and move more cars out the factory gates, and they flog them at the end of three years into the second-hand trade. We're doing it for completely opposite reason, and uh, it has completely different outcomes. It completely influences the design of the car, as I've already said. The customer will typically take a three-year contract, but it has a fixed uh, rate for having the use of the car and a mileage rate, like a usage rate on a mobile phone. It covers all your costs, including insurance, but especially fuel. The second difference is at the end of the lease, the car comes back to us. We don't sell it into the second-hand trade. We provide the second, a third, or fourth-hand customer. And I believe these two things are absolutely critical for a real, proper, circular economy business model that gets the maximum benefit both for the environment and for the customer and for the, 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 the business. And the two, two key things are, one, that the product should stay on the same balance sheet from a clean sheet of paper when we design it right through the end of life. And secondly, we must internalise all operating costs on that same P&L. And if you do that, all your drivers are completely different. You have a driver to excel on product life, a driver to excel on energy efficiency, not just to comply with 95 grams per kilometre tailpipe. There's a lot of cars out there that comply with 95 grams per kilometre because that's the, the threshold that has belatedly come in because it's been delayed by the industry lobbying and it's too weak. But nobody's shooting for 60 grams per kilometre what we need is drivers to excel, and we can't do that with regulation. We can only do it with a change in, in, in business model. Um, and uh, I've talked about backcasting. I've talked loosely about alignment of interests. That's the single thread that runs through all our strategies. We're trying to align our interests in every relationship we build in, with every stakeholder with whom we engage. And this whole system approach, I sort of 
uh, talk about it being an Aikido approach. We're working with the forces around us rather than using brute force to compete in the marketplace. And uh, um, that applies just as much to the, to the technology. We're working with all the, all the, all the uh, things at our disposal and, and their characteristics uh, as much as it does to the business model. And this business model is more profitable and more resilient. And it, it, it's, we argue it's more profitable in this business model, designing for longevity, designing for efficiency and low running costs, because 100% of the revenue comes to us. If you sell cars, the maximum that goes to the manufacturer in, of the revenue generated by a car in its life is about 35%, including the sale of the car initially. 65% of that revenue goes elsewhere, and there's nothing you can do about it. But 100% of the revenue comes to us. And it means that our pricing to the customer is not driven by the build cost of the car, it's driven by the lifetime cost. And the lifetime cost does include the build cost at the beginning, it includes all the operating costs and end of life. The industry regards end of life as a 200 euro liability under current legislation. For us, we know it's going to be asked end of life, so we design for maximum recovery of value. Not just raw materials, but components that you can refurbish and use again. We design it to maximise the length of the revenue stream. We design it to minimise the operating costs, because we're not making a 1,500% markup on the spare parts, and we're paying for the fuel. And those three things, end of life value recovery, longer revenue streams and lower operating costs, can all offset a higher build cost. So we can come to market long before it's as cheap for us to build uh, um, as a petrol car, but at the same price to the customer. If you sell cars, this is a typical supply chain cost curve. Cars are incredibly cheap, incredibly good value for money. But if you're going to compete with any zero emission car today, they're all more expensive, you've got to get the supply chain cost down to match that of petrol engines. To do that, you've got to get volume up. To get the volume up, you've got to get the price down. And that's a chicken and egg. But if you sell a service, we can come to market at the same price to the customer long before it's as cheap to build. Um, and um, so that's, why, that's essentially why it's more profitable. It's also more resilient. And that's because when the economy softens, people stop buying cars. There was a, some company saw a 50% drop in sales in 2008. But they don't stop driving them. And we're not paid for selling, we're not selling cars. We're paid not for the cars we make this year, but for the cars we've made in the last 20 years. That's what generates our revenue. And that revenue stream is much more stable in, in economic cycles. Subscription models also much, have a much higher retention rate. Um, we've seen that. We also have much lower fixed costs um, than the conventional industry and much higher variable costs. And that means we can modulate our production much more robustly without getting into financial trouble. In fact, we've got a model that looks out through 40 years of, of volume production with five plants. And if we reduce the production um, in all those plants, for the entire life of the model, to only 33% of the capacity of the plant, that's when we hit an IR, a rate of return of zero. So until then, we're still in profit. And that's an enormously flexible model compared with the current model. And it also future-proofs the business. It future-proofs us against legislation and regulation, because as I said, we have a profit motive for staying ahead of the regulation. So the no, regulations are no threat to us. It insulates us from commodity price shocks partly because we use far less raw materials, but also because we lock them up on our balance sheet and we decouple our revenue from new virgin materials as the uh, business materials. And we insulate ourselves against the threat of energy price rises. And energy prices are very tightly coupled across the board. We use less energy than any, any, any of our competitors. So if energy prices go up, we, relatively speaking, become more, more competitive. Um, now, I've focused on that mobility as a service because that's really the key core strategy in the business. But uh, I've mentioned open sourcing IP. We're moving this business model upstream into supply chains that we don't buy components. We, we pay for the electricity from a fuel cell rather than for the fuel cell itself. Um, we've got uh, uh, the same logic of aligning our interests with suppliers has led to our infrastructure strategy to build 
the opportunity for uh, a, a strong business case for investment in infrastructure, so that will develop. Um, distributed manufacturing enabled by having composite materials, small scale plants, but many of them dotted around the place. And, um, but, but, the, the, but the selling service is really the core of it. So finally, I'd just like to talk about the governance, um, <coughs> which I think is incredibly important. Um, I think that not only do we have to develop new technologies and new business models, but we have to internalise a whole new frame of reference, as I said right at the beginning. And we need to do so not only to nurture these new models, but to even be able to conceive of the solutions that we need. Uh, and uh, this is this made me realise just how powerful Einstein's quote is, that you can't solve a problem from the same consciousness, consciousness that created it. And I think that the governance is absolutely critical for driving the behaviour and the outcomes that uh, we'll see. And I think that primacy of shareholder value is one of the, the central fundamental barriers that we have to sustainability, in fact. We need to mobilise business to solve the problems that it's created. But the interests of shareholders are not well correlated with the interests of society. And to achieve real alignment, uh, to design businesses to deliver environmental and social return as well as financial, means that fiduciary responsibility need to all these interests needs to be balanced. So in our model, uh, it is a for-profit model, the money flows in the same direction as a normal business. The investors take all the dividends. But we've effectively decoupled equity and control. The control of voting shares are held by six companies limited by guarantee that represent the six critical stakeholders with whom we engage and on whom we depend. We want to maximise goodwill from all these stakeholders and we can't maximise goodwill of five of them if their interests are subordinated to the six. Each of those has equal voting rights in the governance of the company, but they have no equity rights. The investors have voting rights in the investor custodian and the investors between them control that one vote, but they don't control the company. And, um, and we believe this delivers a much more profitable and more resilient company that will never get into the sort of problems which are all corporate governance problems such as Dieselgate and Deepwater Horizon, which all come from taking short-term risks with long-term benefit streams to other stakeholders in order to maximise the quarterly return. And so for some investors, we've got a lot of investors who've joined the company having no interest in cars, but because of the governance model, because they recognise that this is a better investment in the long term. It's no good for day traders who want to capture some value on the stock market, but I do believe it, it aligns our interests with, with society and, uh, uh, and with the market and consumers in a way that will deliver a more resilient business. The upside of this also is that we move from a world where we have to rely on social enterprise, where you accept that you're going to deliver some environmental and social return, but you're going to have a compromised financial return. I don't believe that that is inherently necessary, but if you design businesses to make money and then ask them to deliver environmental and social return, it is always a cost, and that's why you get the compromised return. But if you design a business to deliver environmental and social return as well, uh, as, well as financial, they can be complementary and actually can enhance the financial return. Um, so I'll stop there, Charlie. I'm not sure I've probably taken more than half an hour, but... Um... No, perfect. So I've got one question on cars and one on mobility. Um, and my car one, just, just as a, a background stat, so 90%, I looked at the stats before this, 90% of all passenger kilometres in the UK were uh, driven by cars, vans or taxis, like road-based transport. So we're very, very car dependent uh, mobility culture. About a third of households don't have a car or don't have access to a car, so it's also a bit skewed. Yeah. Um, and I thought your, your characterisation of your business model is obviously super interesting and sort of disruptive in the sense of how it shifts incentives towards circularity, um, as you explained. But there's a literal elephant in the room in that uh, last year, globally, 46% of all new cars sold were SUVs. 
And obviously, as the, the bigger and bigger that cars get, the more and more the sort of efficiency gains from the sorts of light weighting and so forth that you described are eroded. Um, so 46% were SUVs and 14% were EVs, electric vehicles. And of those EVs, about half were SUVs, ESUVs. So there's sort of, in the market, there are these apparent consumer preferences towards bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so how, and, and your, the, the river simple model is towards, towards more of the sort of smaller, more urban oriented cars. So how do you see this playing out, um, both with river simple specifically and with cars more generally? Well, I suspect that our custodians, I hope, would never let us build an SUV. So um, I think we're going to be going there. I also think that um, there, people want SUVs because the industry spends billions telling them they want SUVs. They spend billions telling them they want new cars. And they've been doing that for years. But it's, SUVs is the big one because they make more money from them. It makes much more money. There's much more margin in a bigger car. It doesn't cost you much more to make. But you can sell it at a much higher sticker price on the windscreen. And, and there's a real crisis emerging now in small cars. Um, the bulk of people need a car to get around. And cost and practicality functionality is mass massively um, um, important to most people. But the cost of motoring, even without electrification, in the last five years has gone up 30%. And... People simply, I even had Lord Bamford pleading to me that we should be doing hydrogen fiestas because his staff can't get to work. Um, they can't afford, they used to have an Astro, it was 15 grand, the equivalent's now 30 grand. What are they going to do? And, and when Lord Bamford is pointing at this as a big problem, you can, you can um, uh, uh, be sure it's a, it's a very significant problem. So customers can't afford it, prices are going up. But crucially, manufacturers can't make any profit out of it, even though the price are going up. So they're all drifting up market. And so that's why they're pushing people into bigger and bigger cars, because they make more profit from there. And even Ford have now dropped the Fiesta, the best-selling car for 20 years it was. And um, if Ford won't make a small car, who will? And, and other companies, I mean, the bottom of the range mini is being phased out. All companies are phasing out and trying to sort of hide the fact that they're not making small cars anymore. Um, so, uh, but, but in our model, we can make a profit at that, that level. And, uh, and I think there's, a very, there's an acute need and there's a very willing market for it. So um, I think the, the, the SUV thing is largely driven by marketing budgets. Right. <coughs> and that's, <coughs> so we were talking about this before, mm. Uh, before your lecture that um, the classic sort of model of disruptive innovation is that the incumbent companies push kind of higher up into these ever higher margin right. kind of more um, high end niches and it opens up space for disruptive innovators to come along and yeah. define new market segments. Absolutely. Yeah, so you see it, car companies have for a long time been drifting up market. So Volkswagen, when they sort of um, started becoming really quite um, respectable in the in the nineteen eighties, considered a quality car. They bought Seat to come in below them because they'd moved up and they wanted something to plug the, the gap beneath them. And then Seat moved up, so they bought Skoda. I mean, it just happens relentlessly. And now Skoda's moving up market. I don't know what they're going to do next. <laughs> so this, so I wanted to ask one one question around. This is also a sort of system innovation uh, question around mobility as opposed to cars. I mean, mm. cars ultimately are ways of providing us with mobility. Um, so the International Transportation or Transport Forum, which is the sister organisation to the OECD, sort of rich, rich countries think tank, um, quite a conservative organisation. They have these remarkable studies looking at the, how you provide mobility, so moving people around, particularly in cities, using shared vehicle fleets. So rather than, so you, you've gone from a sort of, or you're innovating from a selling car model to providing cars as a service model. And they've gone, if you like, one step further to providing mobility as a service through fleets of shared vehicles. And some of their, I mean, these are modeling studies rather than real world test cases, but some of their analyses are, are pretty, pretty staggering that within, so they looked at Lisbon, for example, if you take the exact same mobility needs that are being provided today by vehicles, you could provide the same mobility needs with 3% of the, 
of the cars on the road. So you dramatically reduce the number of cars on the road. And the cars that are on the road are essentially part of what they call a taxi bus fleet. So they have sort of flexible routes and pick people, pick people up and drop them off as they go. So 3% of the number of vehicles, each car gets driven a lot more and the incentives also become aligned like in your vehicle as a service model. Um, and congestion drops away because you've got far fewer vehicles. So this is a, a system innovation that's all about providing mobility rather than providing cars in this yeah. sort of shared mobility yeah. space. Do you see sort of evolutions of your business model thinking in that direction? Oh, well, we absolutely think of the shared car market as an important market. And, and it's not surprising that with our, going back to our three levels, with the purpose that we have, we've come up with a business model uh, in which car sharing really fits well and is an attractive market uh, that we will focus on. If you sell cars, car sharing is a very threatening trend because you just sell fewer cars. So the industry pretends to embrace it, but absolutely will never build a car that's really suitable for it. I know Robin Chase, I met her about 15 years ago, who set up Zipcar, and she asked if we were going to run a car club. Um, and I said, no, but we're very keen on it. We're selling mileage, not cars. So if we can sell more miles with fewer cars, it really makes sense. But we, there's no need for us to run it. It would just be greedy to want to mop up a little bit more revenue. We're very happy to buy all sorts of car sharing clubs, but they're just another customer. And so, well, that's where you're wrong. Um, because we actually have to, they, said they have to fit £1,500 worth of technology for multiple billing and ac multiple access systems and billing systems and things like that. And the industry will never make a car that's suitable for us. But they don't really want it to succeed. We will. And so we would absolutely build, a, and with our small scale economics, we can build designer cars specifically for car sharing and will do. But we don't want to, we don't think that at any point of doing it ourselves because the system level outcomes aren't disrupted as long as we provide it to them and keep it on our balance sheet. They take the risk at the level of a day as to who uses it. We take the risk at the level of a year as to who uses it. Um, so uh, absolutely believe in it, but I don't believe it's the answer for everybody. So our car, and there's a lot of car sharing companies have got into real trouble because quite frankly, it's the, 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 the tragedy of the commons. That people don't look after them and trash them and so on and so forth. So, uh, and if you're out in the, in, in the countryside, it's much less relevant. I mean, I, absolutely believe we've got far too many cars on the planet, especially in cities, but the answer isn't no cars. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I've got I've, well, lots of follow-up questions I could ask about that, as well as about hydrogen, but I'm going to limit myself to one last question before opening it up to the, to the audience about entrepreneurialism and the role of the entrepreneur such as yourself in this kind of very pressing public policy or public purpose context of sustainability, net zero, and so on. Um, so Britain had a good industrial strategy, I believe, in the 70s, or an industrial strategy in the 70s. There was an industrial strategy sort of in the past decade that got published with relatively great fanfare and then sort of slowly seems to have um, faded away. Um, yet the mantra from government around supporting entrepreneurialism and innovation, that you shouldn't try and pick winners, you should try and align incentives and deliver on outcomes still seems to stand. Mm. Um, I, I think you're probably very, very um, gentle in being not as critical as you could have been about entrepreneurial support in the UK. But I mean, if, if, there's, if there's one thing that you would wish for or you could change about how entrepreneurialism more broadly is governed in the context of sustainable development goals, climate change in the UK, what, what would it well, be? I, I can accept and agree with the, the technology neutrality principle, um, partly because they don't understand enough to make a sensible choice anyway, um, but they don't even stick to it. And of course, all the um, investment and support is dictated by the, uh, the deepest lobbying pockets. And so um, uh, they talk about technology neutrality. Um, well north of half a billion, very direct, no, but much more than that, I mean, that's a very old statistic, has gone into supporting battery electric cars, which is a mature industry. It's not where support should be going, mature industries. Uh, so far as I know, the only funding's directly gone into hydrogen um, transport is 23 million. And that is new technology. I mean, Mercedes website, their museum, has got a picture of a van with the doors open, 
1994, world's first fuel cell vehicle. I think, strictly speaking, the world's first uh, road registered fuel cell vehicle. The van doors are open. It looks like it's got a miniature chemical refinery in it. And, and, and there's a lot of work needed to get all that technology under the bonnet at a price that customers can afford with the reliability we all expect. And by and large, the industry hasn't done it. But that is new technology. That's where support should be going. It's absolutely not where it's going. And so it, it's the worst of all worlds. They plead technology neutrality. Um, our deputy chair is now um, Jürgen Meyer, who's chief executive of Siemens. And don't get him onto this, because industrial strategy, we don't have one. What I didn't realise, and there's lots of campaigning for it, and he wants to see an industrial strategy for fuel cell vehicles, because he thinks it is the big opportunity for the UK's auto supply chain. Um, with battery supply chain, we have no hope of competing. It's a really mature sector. Fuel cells um, depends on a whole lot of critical materials that we don't have. Fuel cell industry doesn't depend on critical materials. It depends on innovation. We're pretty good at that. It's an immature sector. It's a real opportunity to dive in now. And he wants to see a national industrial strategy for that. But broadly speaking, he wants an industrial strategy. We don't have one. What I didn't realise until recently is our present government is ideologically opposed to having one at all. In principle, it is interventionist. And so that's why there's been a marked reluctance to do anything about it. It's terrifying, isn't it?